Welcome to the 38th annual Sydney B. Sperry Symposium. The theme of this year's conference is the Gospel of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Our speaker is Terry B. Ball, Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. His address is entitled, Isaiah's Other Servant Songs. Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this 38th Sidney B. Sperry Symposium. The presentations that uh, will be presented today have focused on, on the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And I'm delighted to address that topic this evening from the writings of Isaiah. I love Isaiah. I love this prophet. I love what he wrote. I love the way he wrote it. I love his language. I love the way it makes me feel to read his words. I love his doctrine. It's part of the very foundation of my faith. I know many of you share that same enthusiasm for Isaiah, and I hope that what I share this evening will, will feed that, that fire of enthusiasm. Some of you may be still trying to get some enthusiasm for Isaiah, and I hope that what I share with you might help you in that endeavor. Isaiah bore such a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ. Even his name, the name Yeshia, means Jehovah saves. Latter-day Saints understand that Jehovah is Jesus Christ. Jehovah, the God who spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, is the same being who was tabernacled as Jesus of Nazareth. And so Isaiah's name bears that testimony, Jesus is Savior. We find that witness throughout his writings. The latter chapters of Isaiah contain a series of passage, uh, passages that talk about a servant. A servant whose life and ministry and suffering would bless the whole world. Scholars collectively call these the servant songs. Although an issue of some debate, a typical list of servant songs would include Isaiah 42, 1 through 6, Isaiah 49, 1 through 6, Isaiah 50, 4 through 9, Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, and Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. As we study the servant songs, or servant psalms as these are called, um, it's fun to think about who the servant is. Lots of individuals and entities have been identified as candidates for the fulfillment of the servant songs. In some of the servant songs, Isaiah himself seems to be a fulfillment of the prophecies contained therein. Some of them seem to point to uh, their fulfillment in Cyrus, the great magnanimous conquering king who overthrew Babylon and allowed the Jews to return to, uh, to Israel. And and some, one in particular, the nation of Israel as a whole seems to be the servant. But Latter-day Saints, along with many other Christians, also see the servant songs as applying to Jesus Christ. In fact, I'd like to suggest that whether it's Isaiah or Cyrus or Israel as a whole who might fulfill some of the servant songs in that capacity, each of those other individuals or entities are probably best viewed as a type or a symbol for Jesus Christ, because only he fulfills all the servant songs, and some of them only he can fulfill. Now, by far and away, the most popular and well-known of all the servant songs is Isaiah 53. I love that chapter. The entire chapter is the servant song. It speaks to my heart. I love what it says. It tells us about Christ's humble beginnings and his obscure and un unexpected um, ministry, of his ordinary appearance, of his common life, of his vicarious suffering, of the persecution he would endure, and most importantly of the infinite atonement he would work and what it means for each of us. That's a well-known chapter of Isaiah. And so tonight I've decided not to talk about Isaiah 53 much and rather turn my attention and our discussion to the other servant songs in hopes that uh, you'll appreciate and love them and what they teach us about the Savior as well. So I'm going to begin with Isaiah 42 and cover verses 1 through 7. I add one other verse to this, uh, this servant song rather than stopping it at verse 6. What I want to do first of all is to read to you, um, I'm going to read through these seven verses. If you have your own scriptures, maybe I could invite you to just kind of number or underline or letter or list 
each specific truth we learn about the servant from the servant song. Now let me say at this point that the servant songs can be understood in many different ways to mean many different things. And what I'm going to be presenting in this discussion that follows now is one Latter-day Saint's perspective on how they can be understood to apply to Jesus Christ, particularly during his mortal ministry. And so let's begin with Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I am uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house." beautiful and inspiring language. Now let's look more closely at each of these verses. The very first verse of this servant song tells us much about the very intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. In this verse, Jehovah is speaking um, in the name of the Father and tells us, Behold my servant. Immediately we learn that this Messiah, this servant Messiah, would be a servant of the Father. Throughout his mortal ministry, Jesus bore the witness that he came to do the will of the Father. It goes on, the Father declares, whom I uphold. Christ was supported throughout his mission by the Father. Mine elect, we understand that he was chosen even before the foundation of the world, in whom my soul delighteth. I read that verse and it makes me think about how often the Father introduces the Son and says, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased goes on and says, I've put my spirit upon him. Christ shared the spirit of the Father, the spirit, the will, the mission, the purpose, even to the point that in mortality he could testify that I and the Father are one. And then this very interesting line, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. An astonishing statement to make to Isaiah's contemporaries. The word translated as judgment here from the Hebrew mishpat uh, can mean a kind of verdict or a sentence that could be either favorable or unfavorable. In the meridian of the time, the Jews who had suffered so much oppression at the hand of political enemies probably looked at this in a negative sense and thought, yes, he'll bring forth justice. He'll give retribution to the Gentiles. But the sixth verse of this particular um, servant song is going to suggest that maybe it's a, more of a blessing than a curse because it says he will bring light to the Gentiles as well. Continuing, the next few verses seem to tell us something about what his mortal ministry would be like. Now, you know that in the meridian of time, the Jews were so anxious to have a political deliverer. And so they focused their attention, it seems to be, upon the prophecy dealing with the millennial Messiah, the Messiah who would come with great power and glory, who would overthrow the nations of the earth and usher in the great theocracy of peace and rule as Lord and Lord and King of kings upon the earth and free the people. That's the kind of Messiah they were looking for. And when he came, all the world would know and every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he's the Christ. But in this servant song, Isaiah is telling us about a different Messiah and a very different kind of ministry. He tells us in the second verse that he shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. It sounds like a rather quiet ministry, doesn't it? We know that Jesus' personal ministry was hardly known beyond Judea and Galilee. Much of the world was unaware that he came or left. A bruised reed shall he not break. Some of you may have seen reeds growing in a marsh. You know that they're hollow and they have a silicious wall, and if they get a little nick or a bruise in them, they easily fall over with just a slight gust of wind. But Isaiah is telling us that this Messiah's ministry, his passing, will be so gentle that even a bruised reed wouldn't topple by it. And a smoking flax may be better understood as a smoldering wick, like a, you can picture a linen wick uh, sitting in a, in a little um, oil lamp. 
all about almost ready to go out. It wouldn't take much to extinguish it. But he's saying this Messiah's passing will be so quiet that a smoking flax shall he not quench. Paradoxically, though, he will bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail. He would be successful, nor be discouraged. The word translated here as discouraged can probably be best understood as the idea that he will not be turned away from his mission. He is going to accomplish this. We believe that. In the pre-mortal councils, when he said, Here am I, send me, we understood. We believed that he could and would be our Savior. He shall not fail or be discouraged till he set judgment on the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Now, when we talk about the servant song in Isaiah 49, we're going to point out that whenever you see the word isles in Isaiah's writings, you can plug in the phrase, the scattered covenant people. And see what he's saying here then? The scattered covenant people shall wait for his law. That certainly bespeaks what was happening in Nephite days as they were waiting for the coming of the resurrected Messiah. And it speaks of us as well, part of a scattered covenant people who are awaiting another advent of the Messiah. Continuing, Thus saith God the Lord, and then details all the things that God has done, creating the heavens and the earth, and giving breath to the people and the spirit to them that walk therein. And then he speaks to the servant and he says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. Again, we see this very intimate and personal relationship between the Father and the Son. He's there to support him and sustain him. And he goes on and says, I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant, we would say as a covenant or by a covenant for the people. And then this phrase, to be a light to the Gentiles. A light. Here I think we're talking about light in the DNC 93 kind of sense. To give truth and knowledge and intelligence to the Gentiles. Now the reason I like to include verse 7 in this, servant songs because I think is continuing to speak about the servant's work and it means a lot to Latter-day Saints who have the 138th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and who understand 1 Peter 3, 8 through 20 and 4 through 6. There it says, the servant would also open blind eyes, spiritually and literally, huh, in his mortal ministry, and bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Every time I read of that, I think of those verses from Peter and from the Doctrine and Covenants that tell us that between death and resurrection, Christ made certain that the gospel was being taught to those in spirit prison so that they too would have a chance to accept the gospel covenants and become heirs to all that the Father has. And so if we're summarizing the wonderful truths we learn in this first servant song, think about what he's told us. This servant Messiah, who we know is Jesus the Christ, is foreordained chosen and beloved and supported by the Father. He will have a quiet and largely unnoticed mortal ministry. He would not fail as he worked to bring light and truth and vision and freedom to all of his Father's children, Jew and Gentile alike. I love that testimony and that witness of Isaiah. Now let's look at the second servant song. Again, I want to invite you as I read through this to perhaps in your own scriptures note or mark or letter each specific truth we learn about the Messiah from this passage. You'll find that many of them are similar to Isaiah 42's message, providing another or second witness, I suppose we could say. It begins with the imperative, Listen, O isles, unto me. Hearken ye people from afar. And now the servant is speaking in the first person. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, in his quiver hath he hid me. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I spent my strength for naught, and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, Yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and rise, princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. 
Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, shew yourselves, and they shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. Again, beautiful and stirring promises and language. Let's look at it more closely. Isaiah 49 is quoted in 1 Nephi chapter 21. But in 1 Nephi 21, there's a restoration of text that apparently didn't make its way into the Masoretic text or to the King James Version, which help us understand who the Isles are. Now remember, the King James Version begins with the imperative, Listen, O Isles. But this is exciting additional information that the Book of Mormon adds before beginning that part of the dialogue. And so in the Book of Mormon text, obviously under brass plates, Isaiah 49 began with these words, Hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and are driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people. Yea, all ye that are broken off and that are scattered abroad who are of my people. O house of Israel, listen, O isles, unto me. Do you see the point? He makes it very clear that when Isaiah uses the word isles, he's talking to scattered covenant Israel. And so, listen, scattered covenant Israel, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. And then again, the servant begins to speak in the first person. He gives the same witness that he was called before the foundations of the earth. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. This Messiah would be someone who was elect in the primordial councils. He would not be like some Gnostics Christians in the meridian of time would teach, just simply a very good man born in Nazareth who, at the time of his baptism, God put his spirit in and then withdrew it just before the crucifixion. No, this is someone who was chosen even before he entered this world. He was foreordained. In fact, as Isaiah chapter 7 tells us, he was not just a man, he was Emmanuel, God with us, literally. God, who condescended from his role as the great Jehovah to take on mortality and work this great and infinite atonement on our behalf. Continuing, there's a little bit of tension and perhaps some paradox in this next verse. The servant says, He, and I think this is referring to the Father, He made my mouth like a sharp sword, but in the shadow of His hand hath He hit me. He made me a polished shaft, and His quiver Hath he hit me? Can you see the tension there? It's like I've been very well prepared, perfectly prepared for this, but again, it's going to be maybe an obscure or quiet kind of a mission. We know that Jesus was born in an obscure country to an impoverished couple in the humblest of circumstances, hidden, if you will, although very powerful and well prepared. And then the Father seems to be speaking and says to him, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now, another way to read this, and I think makes really good sense to us, is, Thou art my servant, in whom I will glorify Israel. If you know what God's work and glory is, that makes really good sense, doesn't it? We, I think we can gather from this that the servant's job, his mission, his ministry's purpose, is to glorify the Father. The next two verses, um, there's some real tension and some paradox here, that, and, and perhaps a little bit confusion at first, confusing at first reading. The servant seems to confess, I've labored in vain, I spent my strength for naught, and in vain. It's almost like he's saying, you know, perhaps in some ways I failed. But then he comes to this realization and says, but my judgments with the Lord, my work with my God. Can you see what he's saying? Uh, on one level, it may look like I failed, but that's okay because... I've done the work of the Father. Now, the fifth verse kind of says the same thing. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob again. And though Israel be not gathered, I haven't gathered all Israel yet, but I'll still be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. My God shall be my strength. Can you see the tension there? On one level, he seems to have maybe not met expectations, but that's okay because he's met the expectations of the Father. Every time I read this, I think it's probably well illustrated with what happened on Palm Sunday that you see on your calendars there just before Easter. That Sabbath, um, 
or what would become the Sabbath for us, that Sabbath of the last uh, Passover before Jesus was crucified. You know that in the meridian of time, the messianic expectation ran high and that the Jews in Jerusalem thought that the Messiah would come at Passover. At that particular Passover, the rumors apparently were running rampant that this Jesus of Nazareth might just be the Messiah the Messiah they were looking for, and they wondered if he would come to the Passover. Can you imagine the excitement that must have run through Jerusalem when it was quickly noised about that Jesus was coming to Passover? He was descending the Mount of Olives from Bethphage, riding on a colt, the foal of an ass. And do you remember what the people did? They left the city and they thronged the pathway leading into Jerusalem and they strew palm leaves and coats before him like a returning conquering king. And do you recall what they were saying? They were calling him the son of David, and crying out, Hoshana, which means, save us now. Which tells us what they were expecting. It seems that they were expecting Jesus of Nazareth to ride into Jerusalem, to go to the Antonio Fortress, that great symbol of Roman oppression built right against the temple, and to overthrow that Roman garrison, and to usher in the great millennial reign and free them as a people. That's what they were asking. Hoshana, save us now. But we know that instead of riding in and destroying the Romans, Jesus went and turned to the temple. Mark records that he simply looked around on that day and went back to Bethany. We can imagine the disappointment that the Jews in Jerusalem must have felt at that time. He hadn't met their expectations. They thought perhaps that he was a phony. Some Messiah Jesus of Nazareth is. He didn't even overthrow the Romans. I suspect there was deep disappointment there. Perhaps it was that disappointment that led some of these same Jews who were crying Hoshana on that day only a few days later to yell, crucify him, crucify him, because he did not meet their expectations of what the Messiah should accomplish. But how grateful we are he did not, that he didn't come as the mortal Messiah to overthrow nations and Romans and kingdoms, but came to conquer something far greater He came to conquer sin and death. I believe that may be some of what Isaiah is trying to teach us in this fourth and fifth verse of the servant song. On one level, it may appear that he labored in vain and his strength was spent for naught, but that's okay. He came to do the will of the Father. My judgments with the Lord, my work with my God. And though maybe Israel is not all gathered and redeemed right at this time, that's all right because he's glorifying the Father and being strengthened by him. Now the father seems to be speaking to the servant in verse 6 and said, It's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. I'll also give thee, here's that same phrase again, for a light to the Gentiles. He was the God of the whole earth, as it says, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. The infinite atonement covered all of our father's creations. And going on, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to whom man despises, to him whom nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers. That certainly describes much of his early ministry as he was abhorred and despised. But he makes this great prophecy, the time will come when this Messiah will be viewed differently. Kings will see and arise. Princes shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. Again, God, I'm there to help you and to support you, and I will give thee my servant for a covenant to the people. Now, the Book of Mormon adds the phrase, my servant, to this verse as well, helping us know that the servant song doesn't particularly end at verse 6, as many servant song lists do, but let us know that it's continuing clear through verse 9. And I will give thee my servant for a covenant of the people. Why? To establish the earth and to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. And again, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth and to those that sit in darkness, shew yourselves. His ministry would bless not only individuals in mortality, but even those in spirit prison. And so what wonderful truths we see in the summary of the second servant song. This servant Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, again is foreordained, perfectly prepared and yet hidden in some way. His work is to glorify God. and Eventually he'll be venerated by rulers and kings as he gathers Israel, gives light to the Gentiles, and set prisoners free. Now to the third servant song, Isaiah 54 through 9. The servant again seems to be speaking in first person here. 
The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded, and therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me, and who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall wax old as a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. Looking carefully now at this song, again we find the servant speaking of the wonderful things that the father does in preparing him and supporting him in his mission. He's given him the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in a season, obviously gifted at learning and understanding the will of the father, and his ears are opened to wake, awakened to learn and to listen. He seemed to understand also that there would be persecution before him. As I read verse 5 and 6, you get the feeling that maybe Isaiah even saw and envisioned what Jesus would endure from the Sanhedrin on the night of his rest and from the Romans to whom he was delivered thereafter. As he says, I was not rebellious, neither turned away a back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He bears his testimony that he knows that God will help him, that he would not be confounded. Interesting imagery with the phrase, therefore I have set my face like flint. I suppose we would say his his goals were set in stone. He was determined that he would carry out the will of the Father, regardless of the personal cost. And he knew that he would not be ashamed or fell. The last two verses seem to issue a challenge to those who would reject and contend against him. He lets them know that if they persist in such an action, that they would wax old and, and, and pass away like a moth-eaten garment. As we consider that, uh, that prophecy, we see much of it fulfilled. And what happened to those who, who were responsible for his crucifixion in the centuries that followed. And so in this third summary of the song, we learn that this servant Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, will be taught by God and have the talents and skills required to be successful in his mission. He would be obedient to the Father, and even though it would require him to endure persecution, he would see it through to completion. And throughout all this, he would be helped by God while those who contended against him would pass away. A beautiful testimony fulfilled perfectly in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now the fourth of the servant songs we're going to discuss this evening, Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. That certainly describes what would happen after his death as kings and rulers did indeed come to worship him and recognize him and we put him in his proper place. The next verse is interesting. As many were astonished at thee, His visage, meaning the servant's visage, his countenance, his appearance, his form, his visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That observation begs the question, how was Jesus' visage, his form, marred more than any other man's? As I think about that statement, it draws me to Gethsemane where he suffered and endured more than any human could ever do. The way that Elder Talmage described it, as he spoke of Christ's experience in Gethsemane, he said, He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain or mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an extrusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. No other man, however great his powers of physical or mental endurance, could have suffered so, for his human organism would have succumbed and syncope would have produced unconsciousness and welcome oblivion. In that hour of anguish, Christ met and overcame all the horrors that Satan, the prince of the world, could inflict. 
A beautiful description, I think, of what Isaiah means when he says, His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. To me, the most exciting part of the servant song is the next verse, because it tells us why. Why his visage would be so marred. Why the agony of Gethsemane. It starts with the conjunction so. Um, it can also be understood to mean therefore or thereby. Let's use therefore or thereby. His visage is marred more than any other man's, and his form more than the sons of men. Thereby shall he sprinkle many nations. Now, the word sprinkle in the Joseph Smith translation, uh, it's rendered as gathered. That makes excellent sense to Latter-day Saints, doesn't it? By and through his suffering in Gethsemane, by being marred more than any man, he will gather many gather them back to the Father, bring them at one in his presence. To the Hebrew, the verb sprinkle would have also made excellent sense. Think about how the verb sprinkle is used, what context it's used in the Old Testament. Most of you recognize, I think, that it's typically used in the context of sacrifice, in rites of purification and sanctification. For example, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take the blood of the sacrifice into the most holy place and sprinkle it about the most holy place around the, uh, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. In the rites of purification for a leper, the, um, they would take, he would take the blood uh, mixed with water from a sacrificed dove and use it to sprinkle the leper in the process of purifying and sanctifying him and making him clean. And so we can read this verse, he would be marred more than any, he would suffer so extraordinarily that he might gather, that he might purify, that he might sanctify us. Isaiah understood perfectly the purpose behind Christ's vicarious suffering. And then bears the testimony, the kings would shut their mouths at him, for that which they had not been told shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Again, this wonderful promise of hope Though he may be despised and rejected and endure persecution and suffer more than any man, the time will come when he will receive and be honored in his rightful place, recognized, recognized even by kings. We see that literally as kings of nations make Christianity their state religion. Latter-day Saints see it fulfilled in another way, as individuals who have the opportunity to become kings and queens and priests and priests recognize him as their savior and honor and love him. Wonderful truths are learned in these other servant songs. I'm grateful for the testimony that Isaiah bears here, that he has taught us that Jesus and the Father had a wonderful, loving, supportive, trusting relationship, that he was loved by the Father, chosen by the Father, obedient to the Father, perfectly prepared by the Father, and ever determined to do the will of the Father regardless of the cost, that he would come and have quiet and obscure and for the most, as far as the most part of the world is concerned, an unknown ministry. And yet, as he worked that ministry, he would do the will of the Father in conquering sin and death that we might be saved. And in the end, he would eventually be recognized and worshipped and respected and loved as we do. I am grateful for that testimony of Isaiah, grateful to have that witness, and especially grateful that I share that testimony, that Jesus is our Savior, that he did come in the meridian of time, that he became like his brethren in all things, that he was marred more than any man, that we might obtain a forgiveness and become like our Father in heaven. And I bear that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.